What if all your freedoms were revoked, <laughs> your friends turned on you, and you were condemned to a life of fear? And of course, any smallest infraction of any law was immediately punishable by death, no questions asked. What if part of your city was walled in and you were forced to live within those ghetto walls in cramped housing with very little food? People were standing in the street literally begging uh, and there was nothing to give them. There were mothers cradling children, protecting them from the cold, and these children were not alive anymore. They did not want to part with them. What if you were suddenly forbidden to go to school because of your race or religion? I came to school to my classroom. Teacher was standing at the door waiting for me. Suddenly started shouting, translated like, you dirty, filthy Jew, you pig, spit at me, close the door. What if you were forcefully separated from your parents, never to see them again? In the morning, all hell broke loose. Selection. First, they took away children from mothers, number one. Then they separated men from women. What if a family hid you as a child from people who wanted to kill you? What would have happened if you'd been discovered? They would have shot them. They would have shot them, the whole family. What they did was unbelievable. I sometimes ask myself, um, what would I do? I, if, if the tables were turned, would I take such a chance? The city of Warsaw is the capital of Poland. Before the beginning of World War II, Warsaw was a dynamic metropolis and a major center of Jewish life in Poland. More than 350,000 people, 30% of that city's population, were Jewish. Norman Frajman was born in Warsaw in 1929. And life was perfectly normal and excellent up and uh, till the beginning of the war, which was September 1, 1939. We had a, prior to this, I had a normal childhood. My parents were business people. We never lacked for anything. My immediate family consisted of mom, dad, my sister who was 18 months younger than I, myself, plus we were really surrounded by relatives. The good life ended though when Germany attacked Poland and overran the country in two short weeks. The city of Warsaw was bombed without mercy and the uh, government of Poland advised us, the citizens of Warsaw, to evacuate the city and they advised us to go towards the Russian border which is the eastern part of Poland. So the family took a horse and wagon and left. Stopping in a small town near Bialystok, they tried to establish a new life. After some time, though, other refugees told them the Germans were occupying Warsaw, but life remained quite normal. So the family decided to return to their home. We arrived in Warsaw, and go into an apartment, it's plundered, it's bare, but a lot of strange people living in there. So upon persuasion, they uh, allowed us to take one of our room. Just one room in the apartment the family had formerly owned. Oh, well, we settled in, and I went downstairs to play with my friends. Most of them were non-Jewish. Uh, you know, we grew up at the, uh, at the same time, and the parents, uh, were our parents and their parents were friends. Some of them were employed by my dad. But suddenly I became the proverbial Jew boy to them. His former friends bullied him and beat him repeatedly. The friends who had grown up together were no longer friends because one of them was Jewish. Life was fairly, fairly normal. 
up until I would say the fall of 1940 when the Germans decided that they are going to create a ghetto in Warsaw. And like overnight they hung out posters and uh, that we have to uh, leave where we are into a designated area and that would hold approximately 125,000 people. But the population of the Warsaw Ghetto swelled to more than 400,000. 400,000 people crammed into a walled-in neighborhood that was a little more than one square mile. A typhus epidemic swept through the ghetto, and the food rations were barely enough to sustain human life. Between 1940 and 1942, an estimated 83,000 Jews died from disease and from starvation. And people were standing in the street, literally begging, uh, and there was nothing to give them. You could see faces there that were swollen from starvation. They were yellow in power, swollen bellies. There were mothers craving children, protecting them from the cold, and these children were not alive anymore. They did not want to part with them. Many people sold any meager possessions they had hidden from the Nazis to buy food for their families. Life, as survivors recall it, was a hellish place of horror. There were a lot of Schindlers in the Warsaw Ghetto. They came to create industries because labor was cheap. All, all they did, they didn't pay us. They paid it to the Germans, to the SS, who in turn had slaves had a whole pool of, of, of free labor. All they had to do was give us a slice of bread and, and we were good for the day to, to manufacture. The Germans, they had a favorite game. They would run to the ghetto on a motorcycle with a mounted uh, machine gun on it and a sidecar and shoot indiscriminately into the populace, knowing full well whoever they will hit is going to be a Jewish person. The Nazis, he says, were experts in breaking people's spirits. That's one reason nobody fought back. They were demoralized as well as outnumbered. In early 1943, though, groups of young people resisted for six weeks before being overwhelmed by German troops. But Norman and many thousands of others were forced out of the ghetto before that uprising and packed 120 at a time into cattle cars. For the journey, we got two buckets, one five-gallon buckets of water for 120 people, and one five-gallon bucket to relieve yourself. Anybody who sweated in that wagon, somebody reached over and wiped the sweat of their faces to moisten their lips. They endured a four-day stop-and-go journey from Warsaw to the infamous Majdanek concentration camp. During the journey, 12 people suffocated in his railroad car. When they arrived, they were marched into an open field surrounded by barbed wire and towers. First, they took away children from mothers, number one. Then they separated men from women. Then they you had to go by a German who, with the motion of his hand, of his thumb, directed you to the left or to the right. And people who didn't walk straight, people who wore glasses, people with gray hair, anybody who was not a perfect like specimen for slavery, they put them aside, put them away in their lorry, never to be seen again. And this was the last time that I did see my mother and sister alive. Being a teenager who was fit for work though, Norman survived. There were hundreds of concentration camps, but only six killing factories, all located in Poland. Majdanek was one of them. Uh, this was a concentration camp uh, that whenever a transport arrived, and the transport consisted maybe like of 5,000 people at one shot, they took you directly to the guest chambers. They left maybe a hundred people to clean up the mess. People were killed, gassed, 
and then they killed a hundred people. We were immediately dehumanized. I stopped having a name as of then. I was strictly known by a number. You know, the clothing, the, the large got a, a, a small size, a small got a large size. The prisoners labored at non-essential chores all day and existed on a near starvation diet. Food was so scarce that many people ate the grass under their feet. And the evenings brought little relief. They slept in bunks stacked three high. Each bunk had a blanket that was infected with lice and everyone wanted the upper bunk. Why everybody wants the top? Because by eating grass, people came down with diarrhea and dysentery. And this stuff trickled down like, you know, because we slept on slots, plus that little straw on it. Uh, the place was just, life was absolutely nil. And escape was not an option. Watchtowers, an electric fence, and landmines around the perimeter saw to that. Punishment for even minor violations meant death in the gas chambers or on the gallows. I've been under the Germans for five years. I have seen all different kinds of deaths. Just about everything that's in existence to kill a person. But this stands out in my mind because as they were giving out their last breath already, they had tons of hanging out. They put mirrors in front of their faces to watch themselves die. There was also a case of a father and son. Uh, the father was also cited for a very minor infraction, but there, immediately, they sentenced you to die. So we had to watch this execution also. What was different about this, that his 14-year-old son had to hold the father's hand for 24 hours while the father was hanging. Norman was transferred from Majdanek to another concentration camp in 1943, along with thousands of others. On November 3, 1943, there were almost 18,000 Jewish people left at Majdanek. And on that date, they brought loudspeakers and played beautiful music, and they machine gunned almost 18,000 people to death in one day, calling it the harvest day. He wound up working in an ammunitions factory where conditions were as miserable as in the other camps. But there in that camp, I came down with typhus and I was selected to die because I was non-productive. And I was rescued by uh, one of my very close friends who was a carpenter. He literally plucked me out of the line of the condemned and brought me to his shop and hid me behind some wood shavings there by saving my life. Somehow, Norman survived his sickness and went back to work. With the Allied troops closing in, though, he was once again evacuated and this time sent to Buchenwald, a camp deep inside Germany, where he assembled bazookas. That's where he was given the jacket to wear that he still retains today. From there, we have heard the artillery, we already heard that the Allies, uh, we saw hundreds, literally hundreds of planes flying over us. Remember, we we're not too far from Dresden, and uh, one day that you couldn't see the sun. That's how many airplanes there were. And they just destroyed the city in no time at all, just pulverized it. It was mid-April 1945 when the Nazis evacuated the camp and sent the prisoners on a death march. They walked until May 7, 1945, when they were put up in a school for the night. In the morning, we get up, there's a tank in front of school. I said, okay, this is the end of us. They probably gonna do away with us because they wanna uh, cover up the atrocities and that's it. But the turret opens up and out comes the Russian officer. And that was the day of my liberation. I attribute that sometimes to Providence, that I was meant to stay alive. There's no other explanation, because nothing that I could do possibly would prevent them from killing me. It was just 
they have a word called Bashert, which means it's meant to be. And that probably was my destination. How does Norman feel about the so-called revisionists, the deniers who claim the Holocaust never really happened? This is part of my calling, to call them a liar. As long as I am a living witness, nobody can deny this. Nobody can deny this. In 1945, at the end of the war, General Dwight D. Eisenhower, the Supreme Allied Commander, anticipated the deniers. He wrote, the same day I saw my first horror camp. I have never been able to describe my emotional reactions when I first came face to face with the indisputable evidence of Nazi brutality and ruthless disregard for every shred of decency. I made the visit deliberately in order to be in a position to give first-hand evidence of these things, if ever in the future, there develops a tendency to charge these allegations merely to propaganda. During the 1930s, France welcomed Jewish refugees from Poland, Germany, and other countries caught up in the hatred spewed by Adolf Hitler and his minions. But all that changed when Germany invaded France in 1940. Things were getting very bad in France. Um, you weren't allowed to, as a Jew, you were not allowed to shop until late afternoon, and at that point, everything was gone from the stores. Uh, you were not, the Jews were not allowed to ride in the subway except in the last car. Jews were also excluded from public life. They couldn't attend theaters or movies, nor could they work as doctors, lawyers, or teachers. Rosette Goldstein's mother and father were born in Poland and were childhood friends. They emigrated to Germany and then to France, where they married in 1937. Rosette was born in 1938. My father heard about a um, way to protect my mother and I. And this way of protecting them was to work for the French government and the occupying forces. Uh, he was given a paper stating that if he worked as a lumberjack in a small camp in the countryside in France, that they wouldn't touch my mother and I. So her father, David Adler, went to work cutting down trees. And in the evening, he was allowed to go through the countryside. Most of the men were let go after work. This was right at the beginning. And they would go to the different farms in the area and ask for, in, 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 you know, they, they would barter their working, they would, they would help the farmers, and in return the farmers would give them some food to send back to Paris. As the situation deteriorated, her father grew increasingly concerned and didn't trust the paper that provided so-called protection for the family. So he and my mother, I guess, discussed that I should be hidden. He had been going to this one farmer, Monsieur Martin, to help him with chores and again to get some food to send back to us in Paris. And he said to Monsieur Martin one day, he said, I have a little girl and she's three and a half, three and a half almost four years old. He says, I need to hide her. Would you take her in? The farmer said he needed some time to consult with his wife. And the next day he said to him, I have three daughters, we have three daughters, we'll have four. It was as simple, simple as that. Rosette's mother put her on a train with a Christian neighbor because it was too dangerous for a Jewish woman to take a train. The little girl was scared out of her wits. We got to the farm in Volondry, and my father was there. It was the evening, my father was there, and I was always very, very close to my dad. Um, so that him being there was wonderful. 
her father would come from the nearby work farm in the evenings and play with her. One day, she remembers, her mother appeared, despite the fear of arrest by Nazi troops. Somehow she got to the farm, and my father stayed overnight. Next morning, he went right to the forest to work without going back to the camp. All of a sudden, they burst into the farmhouse, uh, we had a fireplace, and I could see them standing there with guns. And um, they asked where David Adler was. They said that if he wasn't back in one hour, that they were taking my mother and I and deporting us. Monsieur Martin went right to the forest. He took his bicycle and uh, saddled the horse. I don't remember that which he did, but he, uh, he went to the forest and told my father, and my father immediately went back to the camp. My mother disappeared, went to, back to Paris, don't know how. And somehow, I guess, they forgot me. Her father would still come in the evenings, but this was 1942, and deportations from France began, mostly to the Auschwitz death camp. And I used to run down the path from the farm and wait for him. And he would whistle. He'd, he had an old bicycle that Monsieur Martin had given him. And he would ride this bicycle. And when he saw me, he'd start to whistle t a tune. So I knew he, it was him. And he'd scoop me in his arms and, and hug me. And then one day, I'm waiting. I'm waiting. And, um, didn't show up. All of the 70 men in the work camp had been deported to Auschwitz. And I knew, we all knew what was going on. As little as we were, we realized what was going on. My life went on in, on the farm. They were very, very good to me. Uh, I call uh, the daughters, my sisters of the dark days. One day, um, Odile, the youngest, she saw a, a truck stop at the end of the path with Germans coming out of it with guns. And immediately, they took me, uh, the farmers took me, put me in the next room in, um, under the mattress. And at that time, the old beds had these big springs so that I was face down on the springs and the mattress on top of me. And uh, they looked around the farm and took food. Uh, you know, it was a farm, so they took all kinds of food and left. Again, I was lucky. Second time, I saw them. And I ran in and told Madame Martin, and this time, she had Odile go with me um, on top of the barn where they kept the feed for the cows and hid me under the feed. Again, the same thing. The family kept her hidden throughout the rest of the war. Her mother never managed to visit her again at the farm, but Rosette was protected by the Martin family until the war was over. The Americans came in, and I remember <laughs> I remember sitting outside with, with the family and seeing all these planes up there and, and uh, one of the men played the accordion and um, he played the Marseillaise and we just applauded and, uh, you know, was so happy that we were free. She rejoined her mother in Paris. Her mother already knew that her father had been killed. It was very hard for my mother, very difficult, because she was alone. Um, my aunt, my uncle, and my two cousins had been taken on convoy number eight. They all died in Auschwitz. Her father had been taken to Auschwitz and then taken on a death march to Buchenwald. Another death march to another concentration camp followed. David Adler died on April 6, 1945. The camp was freed 
just five days later, on April 11th. She learned her father's fate from a survivor who was with him at the very end. He told us that he died saying my mother in my name. Wonderful life, beautiful childhood, everything a young girl can hope for. Uh, good schools, entertainment, travel, everything was beautiful. I uh, also had a beautiful home and family life. Liesel Bogart was born in Prague, Czechoslovakia. Growing up, she was surrounded by a large, loving family. My immediate family were my parents. I had a brother who was four years older than I and many aunts, uncles, cousins. We were 43 people in my family. When the war was over, I was the only one to return, to survive. Everybody else was brutally murdered. Liesel's story is an all too familiar one. This beautiful life came to a sudden stop for us in Czechoslovakia. It was March 15, 1939. I was 13 years old at the time, and that morning we woke up and there was a noise. Looking out of our windows, there were German tanks driving in, German soldiers marching in, and overnight all the homes around us were already decorated with swastikas. Her father owned a small store, and what happened to him was just the beginning. That morning, first day, we came to his store, there was a sign on the door, big sign, no Jews allowed, under Aryan management, the store was taken away. Needless to say that from that day on, my father really was a broken man. He just could not face up and cope with what was happening, just the first day. And from that day on, new laws were put in place that targeted Jews. Jews were also no longer permitted in public places. They couldn't use public transportation. Cars, motorcycles, and bicycles were confiscated. Telephones and typewriters were confiscated. And no Jews were permitted on the streets after 7 p.m. The smallest infraction of any laws was immediately punishable by death. At first, when all the laws against the Jews were coming out, first of all, they had a way of identifying us. We had to wear the Jewish star. I still have mine here, if you want to see it. On the left side of our outer garment, at all times, and which it says in German, Jude, which means Jew. This, you see, you had to wear all the time, but if somebody didn't like you, a former neighbor, friend, anybody, could point you out to any Nazi, any German on the street and say, I saw him or her not wearing the star. You were taken away to Gestapo headquarters. No questions asked. You were killed. Her brother was placed on a transport, along with a thousand other young men, to build the Theresienstock concentration camp. A few months later, her parents and her got notification that they were on the next transport. As they walked to the holding place, neighbors they had known for years turned away and would not acknowledge them. Two reasons, they were afraid to say that they know a Jew, and second, they knew where we are being taken, what is happening to us. Nobody came to our help. At that point, we know now that the whole world knew what was happening. The whole world was silent. <laughs> They were packed into a cattle car for a day and a half trip that should have taken less than two hours. We were yelled at, never talked to, always yelled at. Yelled at to form a column of three and we were marched for about half hour. 
I was still with my parents in the same line. We came to a gate, and that gate, like in most camps, it said in German, Arbeit macht frei, which means work makes free. We entered through that gate. We were in a camp called Theresien in Czech, in German, Theresienstadt. Once we entered through this gate, there we went to a selection. My father was taken someplace, my mother someplace else, and I found myself in a barrack in a very, very small area, at first with 27 girls. There was a lot of sickness. When you were sick, no doctors, no nurses, no medication, and of course you were unable to work. If you were unable, you had no use to the Nazis. And that's why, as you entered the camp, in most camps, children, babies, older people, sick, had no chance to survive. Only, and only chance to survive, if you were able to work for them as a slave labor. The Nazis were masters of propaganda. They developed a plan to convince the world that the stories about their atrocities were not true. They would create a make-believe village and invite the International Red Cross to inspect it. They picked our camp for the reason that before the war, Terezin was a lovely little village. It had a village green, it had a church in back with a clock tower, it was a garrison town. Of course, the people were moved out and it was turned into a concentration camp. So they decided one block of barracks around that village green would lend itself beautifully to create that village. But Theresien was so overcrowded, the Nazis transported as many as 40,000 prisoners to other camps, so the streets wouldn't look like wall-to-wall -wall people. They selected 360 younger people, I was one of them, and 600 what they called extras. And we were ordered now to create this village. The barracks were painted, storefronts were created. Everything and everything you can picture in a little village, from a grocery store, a bakery, a sewing room, doctor's office, school room, prayer room, entertainment room, coffee shop, uh, a dance hall, a music, everything and everything including a bank. They even went so far as to print fake money to be used at the bank. And we had rehearsals and dress rehearsals. And the extras were used for boys had to play like a, a soccer team. Extras were used for cheering. People had to go to the bank. Some had to go to school. Some had to sit in a coffee shop. And then the Red Cross came and about a day and a half Two days later, the Red Cross left. During the time they were there, well rehearsed ahead of time, one of the SS men went to the sandbox, tussled little Johnny's hair, who had to play there with other children, and said, would you like another cookie or lollipop or a sardine? And little Johnny had to say, no, thank you, pulling out of his pocket some more candies. I already had enough today's sweet. Once the Red Cross left, the order came to dismantle the phony village. And all the participants in the hoax, some 960 people, were put on the next transport to be gassed. I was told anywhere between 8 and 12 names, actually numbers, we were numbers, we had no names, were omitted from that list. And I was one of the lucky ones. She was fortunate again when the Nazis decided to give Hitler a special present. They would take 5,000 Jews from Theresien and send them to Auschwitz to be killed in one night. 5,000 Czech Jews were selected. My parents and I were in their transport. We were again herded into the cattle cars, always done at night under big lights, as, as all around you. I lost my place near my parents. They already were in one car. And as I was stepping, by then they had put ramps against the car door, because the door was high and it was a big, took too long. This was supposed to speed up the loading. And on the side of the ramp, on each side was an assessment. 
as I stepped on the ramp, one of the assessmen pushed me off. And I fell off, tried to get up, and he pushed me down again. I had no idea what was happening, and I stayed down. The doors of the cattle cars closed, and the train left, which was the last time I saw my parents. At that point, I had no idea why I was pushed off or what was happening. Much later, she learned she was pushed off that train because the Nazis were very exact. Their roster listed 5,000. But they actually had 5,004 prisoners. So four had to be excluded from the transport. She was one of them. After the transport left, I went to the stables where the SS kept their horses. My brother was taking care of a horse. He was like, and he was covered from the transport because he was needed as a stable boy. And he wasn't there. And one of the other stable boys told me, don't you know? I said, what? Your brother was on that transport. I had no idea. Her brother had likely volunteered, thinking his parents and sister were on that transport and perhaps he could help them. The night of March 7th, out of the 5,000, only 3,800 were still alive. The rest was killed, what was called natural causes. The 3,800 went that night to their deaths, fully knowing what is happening to them, but they resisted. The law was when you entered gas chambers, you had to be undressed. They were told you getting a shower, which of course was not the case, and they knew it. But they resisted to undress, well documented by now, and they sang to their last breath the Czech anthem and the Hatikva, which is the Jewish anthem. Finally, on May 7, 1945, came the day that Liesel and so many others had prayed for. Their camp was liberated. But she had gotten very sick and was isolated in a typhoid barracks at the time. A friend came to the window, waving something back and forth in her hand, a slice of white bread. Seeing that in her hands, I realized we must be free because we heard the oncoming uh, front, we heard the shooting and all before I lost consciousness. So we knew it can't be long anymore. And then it dawned on me, seeing that slice of white bread, and that's now 65 years later. Every morning, I have a slice of toast for breakfast. I remember freedom. And this was all done in the name of hate. And it's still going on today. It's still going on in, in different countries. and uh, We haven't learned. Man has not learned. I have the most wonderful credentials for hatred. I earned the right to hate. But my answer is no, I do not hate. I dislike him immensely. To me, they lower than a snake's belly. But I cannot utter that word of hate because this is what brought this whole tragedy on. And if I become a hater, Hitler would have succeeded in making a hater out of me. And I simply am not going to permit him. <laughs>